So, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Here is uh, Davide Taibi from Tampere University, and uh, I'm very happy to chair this uh, session on uh, software architecture and design. Today, we are having uh, five papers, uh, three of them full and uh, two short papers, uh, and uh, all the papers are about software architecture, and in particular to decision or migration to cloud native system, including microservice and other architectures, uh, or decision on recovery uh, of uh, different type of architectures. So uh, I'd like to give the stage now to the first um, presenter. So uh, Suzanne Braun uh, from uh, Fraunhofer IESA is going to present uh, a paper on the challenges of distributed data intensive uh, system. Something about checking and tackling the consistency of those systems. Uh, Suzanne, uh, please, you have the stage now. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone to our session. So I'm going to present a joint work of great people from Fraunhofer, TU Kaiserslautern, and also from InnoQ. And uh, in our paper, uh, we present the results of an action research study. And in this study, we set off to investigate how we can tackle consistency-related design challenges of distributed data-intensive systems. Right. So uh, let me just start with a quote from Pat Halland. And he said, now, there is an interesting connection between certain quality attributes and the need for so-called application-based eventual consistency. Now, if you look at the quality attributes that he mentioned, and also at the ones that are closely related, uh, you will realize that these are all qualities that we commonly try to achieve with a modern software architecture design. Therefore, I believe it's important to understand eventual consistency and also its pitfalls. Now, the thing with eventual consistency is that uh, consistency is not realized with serializability, which is a common technique usually about applied in relational database management systems. Now, this has some implications for your application. In particular, you will have to deal with some tough challenges related to concurrency control, and in particular, uh, you will have to deal with update conflicts. Now, this is a huge source of human error. And according to our experience, uh, most practitioners uh, at first underestimate the complexity of these challenges, and they commonly try to approach it with trial and error. Now, another uh, thing that we learned in past case studies is that uh, you really need to address these challenges already, already very early in the design process when you uh, decompose your overall application domain into the different subdomain models. And then, of course, you need to consider it during uh, the actual design of the domain models itself. Right. Unfortunately, there's only very little engineering guidance available directly aimed at these challenges. And correspondingly, our research question was, how can we design safe, eventually consistent domain models in a targeted way? Now, let me just share uh, the definition of a safe, eventually consistent domain model. First, it's an ordinary domain model according to uh, domain driven design. And it consists partly or fully of eventually cons consistent data. And also, it can be updated safely and concurrently at different nodes of your distributed system. Right, so when we started uh, the study, we already had an early version of a novel design methodology, which is based on domain-driven design. And this uh, methodology, it basically aims at two goals. First, uh, we try to uh, optimize the design of the domain operations so that these can run concurrently and also conflict-free at different nodes. And we refer to this as uh, semantic compatibility, and we in particular exploit domain semantics and properties such as commutativity to achieve uh, uh, compatibility. Second, we try to minimize the chance for conflicts, and we do this with an optimized design uh, of the domain objects. 
Uh, both is covered in different guides. First, there's the domain operations design guide, and we also have a domain objects design guide. Uh, now, at the core of the domain operations design guide, uh, there is a compatibility relation for domain operations. And at the core of the domain object design guide, we have a taxonomy that basically divides uh, the aggregates of your domain model into trivial ones and into uh, non-trivial ones. And uh, the advantage of uh, trivial aggregates is uh, that they rule out uh, the possibility for conflicts. Okay, uh, we applied action research and action research is commonly conducted in different cycles. Each cycle has five phases. So you start with diagnosing the problem, then you plan your actions in order to address these problems. And what you also do in this phase is you already plan how you are going to evaluate those actions. Then you execute the actions, you conduct your evaluation, and in the end, you try to derive some learnings, which can, of course, be input uh, to follow up cycles. Right. So uh, we conducted our action research study in a medium sized platform development project. We had five full time equivalent persons uh, working in the team at the case company. Right. And uh, we conducted two cycles. In the first cycles, our uh, actions were that we uh, completely resigned, redesigned an already existing model, and we also applied our initial version of the guidelines. In the end, we learned that there were several areas for improvements, so we ran another cycle, and this time we designed a new model completely from scratch. Right, so let's look at how we evaluated uh, our methodology. So first, we wanted to evaluate its effectiveness. And for that, um, we simply counted the share of compatible domain operations in resulting models. And we also counted the share of trivial aggregates in these models. Next, uh, we wanted to know um, about whether it's applicable uh, in, in, in real world uh, large scale software development projects. And for that, we collected qualitative data in several focus groups and also our uh, action team members used the diary. And we then used this qualitative data to uh, conduct a thematic analysis on it. All right, so let's look into the results uh, regarding the share of compatible domain operations. Our developers achieved shares between 67% and even 100%. Uh, regarding the share of trivial aggregates, uh, it ranged uh, between 37.5% and 60%. And let me just briefly point out that these are all also very good numbers. Right, so uh, let's also look into the qualitative results. So one important insight was um, that developers perceived the redesigned model uh, from the first cycle as much more clearer and less complex. And uh, one developer even stated that by applying the guidelines for him, things became more explicit in the model and the guidelines kind of forced him uh, to be more explicit. And he perceived this as very helpful for structuring the model and for coming up with an improved design. Right, there were also some areas for improvement. So the most important issue was that the domain operations design guide needed a major rev revision, sorry. Uh, because it was uh, hard to understand, right? Um, then in the second cycle, developers clearly stated uh, that now the guidelines were comprehensible, supportive, and applicable. And another insight was that developers perceived the overall additional complexity that was introduced by following our guidelines uh, overall as low, right? Uh, one thing that programmers uh, would have wished for is that it would have been bef beneficial if there would have been available a programming framework directly supporting our design methodology. And another learning was that the methodology, of course, uh, requires already some advanced level of experience with uh, domain-driven design. Right, so let me just very briefly summarize the key results 
So what we achieved um, was a very high share of compatible domain operations in the resulting models. Uh, there was a high exploitation of the potential to uh, design parts of the model with uh, trivial aggregates. Uh, developers perceived the guidelines as supportive, comprehensible, and applicable. So all over, we are quite happy with the results, and we already started uh, to teach our methodology to external practitioners uh, in talks at well-known industry conferences. And we already also conducted uh, free workshops uh, with external practitioners. And so far, the feedback was really good. And uh, of course, we also use these workshops to uh, collect more objective evidence from, ex from externals to further substantiate our, our research hypothesis. And what we also did, we uh, started to uh, develop a programming framework uh, directly supporting our methodology. Right, so I'm at the end of my presentation already, and I'm uh, looking forward uh, to your questions, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, really enjoy your presentation. So uh, before we get question from the session, so please, I mean, again, I would like to tell everybody in the session, if they want to make question, please write directly um, into the chat, uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube or Twitter. In the meanwhile, I do have a couple of questions from, uh, um, from my side. Do you have some example uh, of aspects not considered by developers? Uh, I mean, you said that with your model, uh, developers consider some aspect that they would have not considered uh, without. Uh, can you give us some, some example? I'm just curious to understand. Yeah, sure. So um, there are some basic strategies uh, to uh, handle conflicts. And very one very simple strategy is, of course, the last writer wins rule, which is also known as Thomas Wright rule. So the last writer simply always wins. With that, you can have, of course, uh, lost updates. So this is something uh, people consider. Um, sometimes they apply techniques similar to Amazon which uh, merges its shopping cart when, when they have uh, conflicts on a shopping cart service, for example. Uh, what the um, guidelines cover are recent uh, results, uh, research results from, from the database uh, management, uh, database management systems community, and also from the distributed systems uh, community, such as, for example, the comp theory, where you try to exploit monotonicity in order to uh, come up with a comm commutative design of your commands or domain operations. So this is one example. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Uh, and is there any kind of extra effort for, for applying uh, your guidelines or methodologies compared to the traditional ad hoc approach? Uh, any overhead? I mean, yeah, I mean, of course, there is some time for, for learning the methodology as it is with nearly all approaches, I, I would say. So this was something that we were in particular interested in, and uh, we explicitly asked the uh, developers in the focus groups about this, and they said, okay, they they personally had a quite high or steep learning curve because they were not no uh, domain driven design experts, but they said, uh, uh, nevertheless, however, they perceived the additional overall complexity as low once you've understood understood. Uh, the methodology. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we do have a, a question from uh, Marco Skalinowski. Uh, very interested research, controlling concurrent data access in distributed system is indeed challenging. Are the guidelines openly available? Where can we get them? Uh, right, yeah. The, there is a version available in GitHub. Uh, you can even see the link is given here in the slides. Oh, yeah. um, and but this is not the most recent one, but we plan to to up to update it soon. So you you can freely access a, a, a written uh, handout of the of the core guidelines. It's on GitHub. Great. Great. Let me take a screenshot just to just to check it out later on. Uh, <laughs> so thank you a lot. Uh, thanks. Uh, um, we can move now to the next uh, speaker. Next paper is uh, presented by. Hamdi uh, Michel Ayas, uh, and uh, it's about grounded theory of decision making in microservice migration. So, when we migrate to microservice, we always need to understand how to make decisions or which decision should be made. So, 
I'd like to give the stage now to uh, Hamdi Michel Ayas. Sorry if I don't pronounce properly. Uh, and uh, also to your, your presentation. Yes, thank you very much. So I am uh, going to present you our paper on facing the giant, the grounded theory study of decision making in microservices migrations. And my name is Hamdi Michael Ayas, and I've conducted this research with Philip Leitner and Regina Hibig from Chalmers University of Technology and University of Gothenburg. So organizations in many industries are increasingly adopting microservices uh, to design, develop, test, and maintain software systems. And such uh, service-oriented architectures that microservices are uh, the systems are deployed individually in individual pieces that are autonomous and independent. And uh, microservices are used in new software systems, in designing new systems, but very often an existing system needs to be migrated to a microservices-based architecture for many benefits like scalability, uh, maintainability, and so on and so forth. Uh, the value to move towards microservices is uh, somewhat clear, but how to do it is not always so straightforward. And that's because um, changing the software architecture is a complex task. And also architectural migrations are heavy in decision making, either an individual team level or organizational level. So with defining the decision making processes of migration initiatives in software development organizations uh, can help us to better understand such transitions and can help achieve their realization by, desi by design rather by coincidence. Uh, there is a lot of knowledge from practice and academia on how to technically enact a migration, but this knowledge is often not so close to those migrating and engineers uh, learn along the way. So they try uh, in iterations and they fail and they try again until they get it right. Uh, also, uh, existing solutions like program decomposition software are often not addressing the decision making of engineers in migrations. And uh, um, because migrations often entail decisions that are bigger changes than just a systems upgrade they're a bit more transformative on the organization as a whole. And we have a lesser understanding on the non-technical aspects of migrations uh, rather than the technical aspects. Uh, finally, there is a lack of approaches providing details on the operational choices that software development teams and organizations make during the migrations. And uh, therefore there is room for empirical understanding uh, of migrations from the engineer's point of view. Uh, so the objective of this study is to holistically chart the decision-making processes that happen on different levels of microservices migration projects, inductively from empirical evidence. So we aim to understand the architectural design decisions in microservices, how they tackle different challenges. We also, and, and in order to see, how, understand how to navigate the migration process, and a strong emphasis uh, is given on the multidimensional nature of migrations towards microservices, uh, considering business, organizational, as well as a technical side of uh, migrations. So in order to achieve these objectives, we have uh, two main research questions. The first one being, what is the decision-making process of organizations during a migration towards microservices. So what are the decisions and at which point are these decisions made? And what are the typical options that organizations can choose in each of these uh, decisions? In order to answer these uh, research questions, we went and we talked to engineers that went through uh, migration. So we, uh, we conducted 19 interviews from, with engineers that come from 16 different organizations. So essentially 16 migration cases we saw that came from six countries and had an average of 7.5 years of experience. And their experience varied from uh, recent graduate engineers that worked, at, that worked on migrations uh, to CTOs of uh, middle-sized um, uh, corporations, and, and they operated in 12 different business domains from banking, uh, gaming industries, telecom, and, and other industries. Um, so the result of our grounded theory analysis is a construction of an initial theory of decision-making in microservices migrations. 
And in this theory, we present uh, three main themes being the business, the business, technical and organizational dimension of decisions. And we represent these uh, in uh, decision points, uh, procedural or outcome decisions. There are alternative options and dependencies between them. Um, the, we don't have uh, enough time to present every single decision point, but uh, starting with the business dimension, um, uh, we noticed that an interesting finding is that was that engineers needed to create engagement across the organization. So they needed to um, uh, propagate the knowledge that they had that um, migration needed to take place to other key stakeholders. And the first decision to do that was usually to how to assess microservices feasibility and uh, potential opportunities. And some engineers choose more practical uh, approaches, other more theoretical through, uh, through just reading or hiring consultants and so on and so forth. Um, another uh, part of the business dimension, uh, decisions in the business dimension was the development of a business case. So engineers find themselves in positions that they had to justify the need to migrate. So uh, they had to explore business efficiencies, for example, and uh, make decisions on what, uh, make estimations on what uh, cost improvements they could uh, put in order to justify a migration to a new microservices architecture. On the other hand, we also uh, saw a set of uh, decisions that were more technical in nature. For example, what splitting strategy should uh, we choose to split our code? How to reuse code? Uh, what granularity? How to expose code and other decisions that uh, can be seen more in detail in the paper? And an example of the first, uh, an example of options for the first decision of uh, what splitting strategy should we use. We saw some cases that uh, um, organizations choose to start a new system on Greenfield. So essentially having two systems in development and then in a big bang phase out the old monolithic to the new microservice. Uh, we saw the option of gradually extracting microservices from the um, from the monolith and then Essentially, there was a, a hybrid uh, monolithic and microservice architecture going on. Um, and the third option sometimes were the, to build only new features as microservices and then uh, keep the old part of the system. Uh, we saw also different variations and combinations of the option two and three. Um, and uh, the third, in the third dimension, we also saw that engineers were often involved in decisions that are regarding the organization and this and how the to structure the company around it. And uh, one theme on this dimension was decisions on the ways to uh, that the organization's operations change. For maybe new agile methodologies were more uh, uh, adopted meticulously. Maybe new testing process uh, and, and other examples of ways that the operations changed. Uh, in the second theme, uh, we saw engineers being involved regarding rethinking the structure of the software development organization. So teams, they had to align differently, maybe through the new design of the microservices, maybe through uh, less functional uh, distinctions between teams. And uh, finally, some engineers had to work on deciding how knowledge is shared among engineers because migrations were usually new projects with new concepts, new technologies, and engineers had to educate, and there was a certain change of mindset going usually, and uh, yeah, lead engineers needed to decide on how to do that. So to wrap up, uh, we saw that microservices migrations can involve decisions and communication from engineers all the way up to executives. And we reflected in the paper on the multidimensionality of migrations in a bit more uh, in depth. Uh, further work is needed on individual decision making and judgment, for example, um, that we might uh, consider look in the future. And uh, in the paper, we also try to provide a, a more pragmatic view of how to engineer a microservices migration within the organization. So not just engineer the system, but engineer the migration and uh, how to make choices that are not only technology driven but are considerate 
of the other factors that change with um, with a technical migration. And finally, our study provides an initial theory of uh, decision making in migrations to microservices, and it could also outfit practitioners with a roadmap of which decisions they should be prepared to make and at which point in the in their migration. So thank you very much for hearing to me, and I'm looking forward to any questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot for uh, your presentation. Uh, really enjoy the topic, and uh, in particular, I, I really enjoy to see very nice raw data and replication package in your paper. That's not very common, especially in uh, in these kind of studies. Beside your presentation, uh, before I start with uh, a couple of questions, there is a question from um, Marcos Kalinowski, um, Suzanne, and Andreas. Uh, so they say the previous uh, paper presenter just published a paper on data management in microservice at VLDB, which tackled the issue from a software engineering plus uh, database. Why it doesn't show? Sorry. OK. Um, we tackled the issue from software engineering plus database perspective. It might be useful in your context. I think this was mainly uh, a note. Uh, I have, I, honestly, I have a lot of comments, a lot of questions, the curiosity. Uh, but let me start just with a few uh, small ones. Uh, which was the more unexpected splitting strategies for microservices? Uh, is there something that was like unexpected from some company? Yeah, so there were a couple of unexpected uh, cases. One was uh, maintaining uh, the, with the first option, so choosing to have a big bang migration and develop two systems at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it was a bit unexpected to me how, um, yeah, how it, it all went of having development resources going into different uh, systems for uh, six months to one year, and, and then the new system failing actually mm -hmm to uh, achieve the objectives and the goals that it had. So I, I had this unexpected uh, organization that was three interviews also. So it was three mm -hmm. people from the same organization that they worked on developing from scratch and then it didn't work. And then they uh, had to um, go and pull uh, microservices from their monolith. And, and, and I had an example of the other uh, vice versa, again, a failed migration that uh, an organization tried to pull microservices, but it was such a mess, such a, a difficulty to do that uh, they had to start from scratch. So mm. I think seeing this contradiction in different contexts was quite interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it happened also to me uh, when I was following a bank to the migration of microservice to see that they were having the two systems in parallel and then testing both and keeping both systems for six months to check whether they were working. Uh, was there, other question, uh, was there any kind of company who were using like serverless based microservices? Uh, and uh, did you find in case, uh, did you find any difference in the processes? Um, so uh, the, in the interviews, I didn't ask specifically for serverless. So we co we considered, yeah, we were a bit liberating that uh, what microservices is because each company had their own, or each developer had their own view of <laughs> sometimes of what microservices. So uh, I, I didn't filter in any way serverless or not. I think from the top of my head, I can recall one organization that might have uh, used serverless. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I understand if you didn't ask. Uh, that's kind of obvious. And last, uh, more curiosity. Uh, what is the, we do talk about the granularity of microservices. Uh, what is the size that they consider to be a microservice? What micro is micro? Yeah, so that, that, that more details of uh, that than in the paper because, again, different developers had different opinions. Mm -hmm. The one I liked personally <laughs> uh, is the one that uh, one uh, engineer uh, described as when I have to write configuration. Uh, so the, the configuration and the uh, management part of the microservice, mm -hmm. the, there is a ratio in mind of uh, when should, how bigger should be or how smaller should be from the actual code of the microservice. 
Uh, mm-hmm. and, and that's how I knew when to stop splitting, when the configuration and the management was about half of the microservice code. Well, interesting approach. Uh, well, Adolfo Neto asked if there is a, a link. Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, it is, was from the paper that was mentioned by Marcos. And I, I guess you can also check uh, the, the chat. And uh, please, in case someone else makes a question to your paper, keep track on the chat. Yes. So uh, there are no other comments in the chat. And I think I already made a lot of questions. Um, then thanks very much. That was very nice work and presentation. Uh, and I uh, hope to see you in person <laughs> in future. Uh, now let's give the stage to the next presenter. The, that is uh, Hyang uh, Zhao. That is presenting a paper on the existence and co-modification of cl- codes clones uh, within or across microservices. Well, we know this is a kind of... Uh, pretty common problem uh, called clones within microservices and curious to see how they addressed it. Uh, thank you. Young, uh, you can start. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, thank you. So, uh, hello everyone. My name is Young Zhao. I come from CCNU. It's my great honor to present our work today, the existence and the commodifications of code clones within or across microservices. So first about the, our motivation. Uh, in recent years, microservice has shown a great deal of attention in software community. The main idea of microservice is to decompose the software into a series of small and uh, loosely coupled services. And uh, each service is developed, maintained, and deployed uh, independently. This greatly improves the uh, efficiency uh, in software development. Uh, however, however, microservice architecture is not a silver bullet in software development. There are still many unsolved problems, such as uh, code clone. Such as code clone. Um, code clone may have negative impact on software development. Mm. Um, for example, code clone can replicate bugs. Uh, that, Fixing one clone fragment means that another fragment also needs to be repaired. In microservice architecture, the scale of each service is small and, uh, and the correlations between services uh, is low, but uh, there may still be code clones. And uh, there is little work exploring the code clones in the suspect to bridge this gap we focused uh, on analyzing the existence and the commodification of code clones in microservice projects. Okay, about our methodology. Uh, first, uh, these are eight projects we selected for our research, and they are all uh, open source projects on GitHub, um, and they are all marked as microservice projects and uh, have all have list uh, uh, at least five variants. And uh, we designed a four step uh, experiment for our research. Uh, in step one, for a selected project, we first prepare five variants of source code, then use an ICD code clone detector to get three type of code clone pair information files. In step two, we use MC Finder to detect the three type cross service or within service code clones. Uh, MC Finder is a small tool we designed for our research and uh, this tool can generate two result files, uh, CCP and uh, CCMF. Uh, CCP lists uh, the locations of code clones and uh, CCM lists uh, the methods or functions containing code clones. Okay, in step three, uh, MC Finder compares CCP and CCMF in V5 with the other variants to identify the code clones that have been modified together and uh, finally writes into CMCCF. And uh, in step four, uh, we take the generated files including CCP, CCMF, and the CMCCF files as inputs. The MC Finder finally calculates a set of measures used for our evaluation. Okay, with the above steps, uh, we answered five research questions. 
and have some results and findings. Uh, first, uh, we want to know in microservice projects to what extent do code clones exist within services? And uh, the answer to the RQ1 is code clone within services happen in most of services compared with type one and type two code clones. Type three clones have a higher potential to happen, meaning that more attention should be given to type three code clones in microservice projects. Based on RQ1, we further want to know, uh, have the within service code clones been involved in core modifications? If so, which clone types have a higher potential of core modifications? And uh, uh, we find that in all, the, in all studied projects, 28.6% to 16% uh, services contained core modified code clones compared to type one and two within service code clones, uh, more type three code clones were involved in core modifications. This means developers should pay special attention to the management of type three clones. And in RQ3, uh, we investigated in microservice projects to what extent do code clones exist across services. Uh, and the result is interesting uh, because we find the code clones across services are common. A large percentage of services have similar code practice and are implicitly collected by cloned code. Compared with type one and two clones, type three clones have a much higher proportion, meaning that type three code clones are most likely to happen between services. And the similar like RQ2, we asked the RQ4, have the cross-service code clones been involved in core modifications? If so, which type, which clone type have a higher potential of core modifications? Uh, so we find even if the microservice architecture is applied, the code clone between services still happen and have core modifications. Uh, it means the management of code clones is necessary for microservice projects. Uh, we should focus on the code clones across services and track their changes for improving software maintenance. Okay, last question. Uh, we want to know what are the characteristics of the core modifications within services or across services. Uh, here, uh, in this two table, uh, the AVG column shows the average log change in each core modification. The TOT column shows the total log change in all modifications. And the CFB column shows the percentage of changed lines to total lines of a pair of cloned code fragments. And uh, the answer to RQ5 is that we can find Type three clones contribute the most change the lock, but the average change the lock and the proportion of change the lines are similar for different types of clones. For the comparisons between within service and cross service clones, we can observe within service clones have more change the lock, but uh, the average change the lock and the uh, CFP don't have much difference. So uh, last, we have some conclusions. Uh, first, uh, we find most services have within service code clones, and these clones do have core modifications. Uh, the result tells us that these code clones have rarely caused maintenance costs. And uh, second, there are cross service code clones in microservice projects, and they also have core modifications. Uh, which means such clones could propagate modifications and validate the independence of services. And third, although more lock were changed in within service core modifications than cross service core modifications, the average change the lock of each core modification and the proportion changed lines in each type code clone are similar. So 
Uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for your listening. Thank you. Very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we do have uh, one question from the audience first. Mm, Jessica Tyler is uh, yes asking why does cross-service code clones exist in microservices? Do you have any further investigation? Uh, okay, okay. Mm, that's a good question. Uh, so uh, in our mind, uh, the cross-service cross code clones should not exist in microservice projects, but uh, as we as we mentioned. Um, in our the, in our presentation, uh, it does exist. So, um, so the um, the reason is that uh, 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 sorry, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, so, service exist in microservice. Oh, okay. So we try some. We have some tries to find the reasons. Um, for example, we check the permits of those open source projects, and uh, uh, we found uh, some developers participate in the development uh, of different services. Uh, I think uh, this may be the part of the reason. And uh, uh, in the future, we will have um, more uh, more research on this question. Uh, and uh, <laughs> this one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, if I may add something, uh, in the greenfield uh, development, so when you develop something from scratch, uh, cross-service duplication should never exist because you should start developing your own service yeah. with your own independent code. But when you migrate uh, something from a monolithic system, sometimes a feature is needed for both two services. And uh, yeah. instead of joining or uh, instead of sharing the feature, some team prefer to have their own independent implementation of the feature. And that is kind of uh, normal. That's part of the migration process is what you, oh. the way that you should or that you have to do a microservice. So it is normal. Uh, something that is also very common is that when you start creating a microservice, you have a clone of an existing or basic stub. And that from this basic clone, of course, you have to have the duplication, but then you're expecting that every service is working differently than the others. So my question was uh, exactly related to this one. So did you under try to investigate in which phase of the life cycle of the microservice uh, uh, the different clones exist? So were they just in the beginning when the service was born? And that is totally OK, part of the, of the process. Or did it happen also after the creation, like several months or several releases after? Uh. Oh, sorry, may I beg your pardon? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so those cross-service duplication usually appear just uh, in the beginning of the life cycle of each microservice, uh, or do you have this cross-duplication also when the microservices are older? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I got, I got this. Mm, yeah. So uh, in our, in our finding, in our, in our research, uh, we check the uh, earliest uh, variants of those. Um, projects and uh, we find that not all of those code clones um, exist in the beginning uh, some are uh, some are added in the uh, in the, in the last uh, uh, variants so um, I think maybe um, they have some uh, update to their projects and add these um, uh, add these clones so um, this is uh, uh, the, um, yeah. this is a uh, interesting research uh, too and uh, uh, we will try in the future yeah yeah thank you uh, we have some questions from the audience uh, so uh jessica taylor is asking uh, why uh do cross-service code clones exist in microservice so do you have any oh, no that's what the preserve was one sorry uh, uh there are few cross-service type one clones and their proportion is very low why okay okay um as we can see that uh, mm, there, uh, there is few cross service type one clones. Uh, maybe this is a result of the selection of our, our, of our projects. Um, in fact, we, mm, we learned from some blogs written by developers of the real world uh, that, and learn from them that microservice projects have code clones, but uh, uh, the projects we used in our research are open source. Uh, 
So it is not likely the real world microservice projects um, in terms of the uh, service division or the number of services. And uh, um, maybe um, the open source projects uh, uh, have a more strictly uh, division of services. So uh, there is rarely type one clones. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, last very quick question. Uh, Rafael is asking, uh, what is the granularity level in which code clones more frequently happen? Entire blocks, methods, uh, or the whole service? Uh, okay, okay. Um, uh, in our paper, we use methods levels, um, but uh, uh, we also tried in blocks. Um, in our research, we find that um, the the two situation is not to uh, have um, very much different. So uh, we use methods because methods can more reflect the uh, features of those projects. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. That was a very nice presentation and I enjoyed the questions. Uh, now it's time to move to the next presenter. So okay. let's up, give an applause to. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, thank Prophet. You. So next presentation uh, is, uh, um, thank you. Okay, next presentation from Daniel uh, Link is uh, about a study on the utility of text classification uh, for software architecture recovery method, relax for maintenance. Uh, very long title, <laughs> you have please yes. on the stage now. Okay. Hello and welcome to our presentation. Uh, you've heard the title, which is very long. I'm not going to repeat it. Um, I've conducted this research with Kamal Forbes Free Sofa and Barry Baim of the University of Southern California. Let's talk a little bit about software architecture as an introduction. Knowing a software systems architecture has benefits for maintenance, research, and other purposes. Architecture is often not available or can be retrieved using architecture recovery methods, which are algorithms. Concern-oriented architecture recovery clusters, source code entities, which are files, by concerns, which can be understood as features. Our method, RELAX, which stands for Reliable Architecture Extraction, does this using natural language processing specifically text classification. Um, here we see an example of part of the textual output that it generates. The syntax is as follows, contain, then the name of the concern cluster and the canonical name of the code entity. You can see here how the parts of the syntax relate to the contents of the file that you see here. Um, where IO stands for IO input output. Uh, there's another block about security and one about SQL in our example here. Uh, here's also an example of a graphical output which shows a directory graph of a given system. On the right, uh, there's a legend that shows the concerns selected for this recovery. No match, which is at the bottom, the black. Uh, square is used uh, when none of those concerns applies. Lines are connecting directories, which in this case are Java packages with their contents, which can be more Java packages or Java source files. Each line is colored for the prevailing concern in the package. The boxes around groups of source code entities stand for packages. Since uh, there had not been a study on the utility of RELAX for maintenance, we became interested in running our own study. And uh, this had two study questions. Question number one, does using RELAX architecture recovery results reduce the time to find the location in the code where maintenance needs to be performed? And the second one, what are the perceptions of new maintainers who work with RELAX architecture recovery results. Uh, for some parameters, we had nine CS master students with at least some Java programming experience as participants. They had at least one year of Java programming experience in academic or industrial settings. 
each participant committed eight hours over all distributed over four weeks with two hours per week. And our sessions with them were live sessions, uh, so we could have more timing accuracy. Our survey that we conducted uh, collected data before the study experiments, such as their pre-existing experience, and then impressions and observations after the study experiments had concluded. Our experiments uh, used uh, the then current version of Apache Jackrabbit, which was version 2.20. They got two tasks. One, you are tasked with making fixes to a file system that interfaces with the database. In order to start your work, you think of adding a few print statements, but where? And the second one, clean up the system after an unreachable former contributor has made modifications to one source file. So it doesn't handle security anymore, but SQL instead. The source file was not renamed. You want to make the system maintainable again and change the name of that file. But where do you look? For uh, the first study question, our um, result was that uh, what you see here is the average time of the control group divided by the average time of the experimental group. Uh, the speed up on task one was a factor of uh, 5.4, and on task two, we got 7.4. For the perceptions of the participants, we got that they strongly agreed that they can learn the structure of the system from the recovery results. The results can support new contributors. Um, they can uh, make different versions of the system easy to compare. And um, running this in real time as an IDE plugin would be valuable. And they can also use it as a source to get started on other maintenance tasks. For a brief discussion of the results and the implication, as already said, the start of maintenance is sped up by at least a factor of 5.4. The participants strongly consider relax use helpful for maintenance. And an IDE plugin should be considered for real-time relax architecture recovery. And about that, I'll be talking on this next slide. So our idea, idea uh, for the IDE plugin uh, that recovers the architecture after each compilation could look something like this. On the left image, uh, you see part of a possible section of the IDE controlled by our plugin. It shows a zoomable graphical overview of the current version of the system on its right. Its upper left side shows a detailed view of the currently edited code entity with some metadata like file size and slog, as well as incoming and outgoing dependencies. The lower left shows the number of issues found in the current version of the system and a way to show details about these issues. As an example, uh, the middle image shows such a possible issue in the form of a layer dependency warning. For example, you might not want your driver subsystem to depend on your GUI. The right image shows a possible config dialog in which auto recovery after each successful compilation can be switched on or off, and existing classifiers can be selected or new ones trained. Thank you for listening to my talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the yes. presentation. I really enjoy. Uh, so uh, just a question about the language. So if I understand correctly, this was implemented for Java, right? Yes, yes. It yeah. could be implemented for other languages, but currently it's only for Java, yes. Yeah. Do you expect uh, some changes for other languages or some big improvement for other type of languages, maybe not object-oriented uh, or uh, should be similar? We are not really depending on the object orientation for this to work. We're basically depending on that um, the code contains uh, truthful uh, comments and words that can be um, associated with uh, topics, right? Yeah. So this could be um, basically any language, um, unless maybe machine language. <laughs> okay. It needs to it needs to have words in it. The words need to be truthful. Yeah. And um, yeah, 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 yeah. Very interesting. Uh, are we gonna talk, are we gonna publish the tool uh, uh, publicly, or is it open source? It's not open source, but uh, I can be contacted, and I would provide the tool to whoever's interested in it for research. Okay. 
Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, I think uh, I'm going to contact you. I need. Uh, I would need for some of research, or it would be nice to collaborate. Uh, so course. there are no other questions in chat. Uh, please, of course, uh, uh, keep an eye on the chat. There, someone might write comments later on. And uh, now it's time to move uh, to the last speaker of this session. Um, okay, Amit Mondal uh, is going. For, Amit Kumar Mondal is going to present the last. So let me. Fix the system. Okay. Semastics, semantic slicing of architectural change commits uh, toward a semastic, semantic design review. Uh, Amit, the stage is yours. Uh, good morning, David. Can you uh, see my screen? Uh, I have only one monitor. Yes, yes, it is perfect. Yes. Okay. Thank Just you. go in presentation mode. Yeah. Okay. Please. Hello, everyone. I'm Amit Kumar Mundal from University of Saskatchewan, Canada. Today, I will talk on our study, Semantic Slicing of Architectural Change Commits to our Semantic Design Review. Uh, I'll go first to, to time concern. So many uh, open source project and uh, uh, project that follow the Agile development methodology uh, do not consider, uh, usually do not consider uh, architectural design concern during the initial phases of development. However, uh, after completing certain milestones or release, uh, uh, the development team uh, uh, review architectural de uh, re design for uh, several reasons, such as paying technical debt, fixing flaws, or correcting the design structure. And for this process, uh, architectural information instruction are essential. Actually, uh, architectural design uh, are reviewed for individual uh, requirement issues. And even uh, for individual commits, uh, multiple reviewers uh, review uh, based on the complexity. So for for this uh, review process, uh, reviewer need to extract uh, various uh, architectural informations. So our uh, study focus is to uh, develop tool for architectural change commit detection and then semantic uh, structural slice extra extraction. So for our preliminary study, we have uh, selected an uh, open source project, uh, which is developed on Java uh, platform model systems and uh, uh, from two languages, Java and Kotlin. So a JP, in a, in a JPMS project consists of uh, multiple concrete modules. We, uh, a module is a cluster of packages and classes. And a concrete module has also a uh, configuration module info Java. Uh, file for restricting uh, restricting different uh, entities from different models. So uh, for architectural change commit detection, we have considered existing uh, uh, change metrics for, such as A2A, IDSD, and uh, model connection directives uh, in, inside the model info Java. A2A uh, means uh, uh, addition or uh, deletion or relocation of component, and IDSD means uh, import modification in Java, class import modification. So uh, here is an example uh, of a structural semantic change slice. A semantic change slice consists of uh, cross-module uh, structure relation. For example, SAS token uh, method uh, uh, added new, uh, cro new class from a cross-module uh, named Azure Store is common. So, uh, for for detecting architectural changes and uh, extracting uh, semantic slices, uh, we have defined SAS uh, 16 uh, SS, uh, uh, semantic uh, slices. We call them SSC. So for detecting and uh, extracting SSCs, uh, we have explored the commit messages of the selected projects, and we have found 16 different types of directory and naming structure properties. In in short, we'll we call them as dense properties. Uh, for example, uh, uh, they, they have some uh, challenges. For example, uh, version control system APIs only return the first and last line for multiple import comment out. So here uh, I'll show an example how an import from an import uh, module cross module information is extracted. A import string is converted to directory structure, uh, then it is uh, sourced into the code based directory structures, then finally we get uh, the, the module name. 
However, uh, the directory structure of modules uh, contains various uh, uh, variations. Uh, we have found at least three variations so from from the uh, our data set. So uh, the dance properties has uh, uh, similar many variations, and we actually uh, need to handle this for uh, developing a tool. So this is the uh, working procedure of our tool. Uh, our tool extract uh, uh, change information using JIT Python API and uh, process string string regu uh, regular expression and finally detect uh, M2M change, uh, uh, architectural change commit and then slice generation. Uh, the slices are uh, saved into YML file. So th this table shows the architectural change commit detection performance. Uh, the lowest precision uh, of this process uh, is uh, 96 percent and lowest recall is uh, 98 percent. For uh, measuring the SSC slice detection, uh, we consider is uh, is uh, entities of a slice as an in, in unique instance. For example, the uh, shown SSC slice has five uh, instances, and uh, uh, the ten samples uh, we found lowest precision 93% and lowest recall is 97%. So we have also tested uh, uh, bias uh, and found almost similar results in precision and recall. So uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the properties actually affected the performance such as the import of a static method in Java and sub module structure in source folder. Uh, however, we have not considered uh, methods uh, in the inner classes and an anonymous inner classes uh, because the JIT Python API does not provide structural information, separate information about them. So these are the primary uh, areas to enhance the uh, tool. So uh, our uh, exploratory study, we have found that uh, dance properties are reliable for tool development and the pro challenges they pose uh, will persist any kinds of uh, method for developing tools and in future we will uh, consider those uh, extracted ssc's for generating more understandable code description focusing design concerns and uh, in future our, our tool will be more intelligent for ass assisting design review and uh, design artifact generation such as uh, design decision recovery so that's all my presentation. Thank you. And any question and suggestion, I appreciate. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your presentation and a very nice tool. I really appreciate that it's also available online and on GitHub. Uh, how long would it take to apply to a different language? Uh, for example, if we want to apply, like, or is it possible to apply to uh, Java or uh, Python, for example? Oh, yeah. Uh, it uh, uh, it uh, supports Java and Kotlin right now, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, as uh, actually our our tool depends uh, only string inform uh, string information from the JIT uh, uh, Python API or JIT API, so it does mm -hmm. not uh, process the abstract syntax tree parsing. Uh, oh, that's cool. why it's easily actually adaptable uh, from any other lang for any other language. Uh, slight mm -hmm. modification, I guess, in the regular expression is necessary. Okay, okay, okay. So, what kind of information it parses then? Uh, it was not really clear to me. Uh, okay, uh, it it parses uh, change uh, change information like uh, addition and deletion of uh, okay. two consecutive commits. Okay, uh, code com com code segment actually. Great, great, great. Okay, very, very interesting. So there are no code, no other uh, questions uh, from the chat and uh, I think it's now time to close this session. I would like to thank uh, um, you, Amit, for this very nice presentation. And uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, let's clap him. So I would like to thank, uh, to, to thank all the speakers for this session and uh, uh, now we have 15 minutes of break before the next session on development approaches, requirement and behavioral software engineering uh, uh, chaired by uh, Valentina Lenardozzi. Thanks a lot. That was a pleasure to see you again. Hopefully next year we we'll see you again in, uh, uh, physically uh, and uh, see you in 15 minutes. Bye.